S D Boyan. This is the Doc with SilverDoctors.com. With gold and silver breaking out of their year-long consolidations, we're pleased to welcome back silver expert David Morgan. Great to be with you. Thanks. Well, it's great to have you again, David. I know you've recently stated that we've seen the bottom in silver, and with the Fed announcing QE3 last Thursday, the downside in the metals sure appears to currently be uh, much more minimal to the downside compared to the upside potential here. Well, yes and no. I mean, basically, I agree. I think we've seen the bottom. I, I made a couple calls. When I made the call on the bottom in the equities, which usually bottoms a couple, three months before the bottom in the metals themselves, that played out almost perfectly. I saw the bottom in silver, I thought. I called it around 28 basis the spot month. And so far, that's been correct. And we're up to almost 35. So, you know, the chances of silver going up another, say, five bucks from here or, or down two or three, that you know, as we're doing the interview, I'd say is could be debated. In other words, it's a pretty strong move. And looking at the commitment of traders and everything else that I look at for a short-term or intermediate-term basis, we're looking at um, probably a pretty high risk-reward profile if you were to get in short-term right now. But long-term, I think we both agree silver is still very undervalued and it's got a long ways to go. Right. From the long-term perspective, if we have indeed seen – um, a long-term bottom around 26. You're looking at no more than eight dollars to the downside, and I think we both believe we have, in the long term, more than up eight dollars of potential to the upside. So I guess, kind of looking back, when QE2 was announced in early 2000 or early November of 2010, we saw silver double over the next six months. Now, obviously, there was other factors in play. Eric Sprott was um, taking delivery of the PSLV order, but do you see? Uh, another such explosive move in gold and silver repeating with QE3 here over the next, say, six to nine months? Do not. I, I've been asked that once before, and I'll be consistent. And, you know, subject to change. I really don't. I think some of the um, move in the metal was before the announcement. So normally markets actually anticipate the future, and the precious metals are no exception. So we started to see this move in silver and gold prior to the QE3 announcement, which just, you know, came out recently. Uh, you know, it's the old buy on a rumor, sell on the news kind of thing. Now that QE3 has been informally announced, it's been uh, all over the, the wires. I think that we may have seen uh, a bit of resistance in this level, uh, and we may see some, you know, profit taking short term. Will silver double again? Basis, you know, the announcement here will it double again. The answer, well, certainly, I think it'll probably triple from here, if not more than that. But Will it get the oomph that it had from the announcement of QE2, where it went basically from 26 to 48 in a matter of several weeks? The answer to that's no. I don't see that this time. I see more of a consolidation period, high-level consolidation, some work to be done before we get above the 40 level. Once we get above the 40 level, there's not much resistance. I see you know, the old high of nominal high, not true high of 48 that we saw back in April 2011, finally be taken out in 2013 and then a new high in nominal terms established in 2013, somewhere between 60 and 75. I said all that to say this. <clears throat> That's assuming that things don't get any worse than they already are. And, you know, just in this last week, we have, uh, you know, China-Japan relations breaking down, India-China relations breaking down, uh, Russia reaffirming that they're going to sell oil to China using the yuan or the renminbi. Uh, lots and lots are going on. Stuff's going on in a week that used to take, you know, six months to a year in the financial world. That's how, in my view, accelerated things have become. So barring anything really getting, you know, much, much worse on a short-term basis, and if that were to occur, then we could see up-limit moves in both gold and silver, and, and uh, you know, you could see a runaway market. I don't anticipate that, you know, sh on a short or long-term basis, really, but I do do think that, that that possibility exists at all times. So you have to be aware, you have to be wise about these kind of markets, especially if you are in the market, and even if you're not in anticipating getting in the market, uh, you really shouldn't chase the market. You really want to be investing when markets are quiet, not when they're they're very uh, robust. Right. We've just had about at least 9 to 12 months of that for both gold and silver. So hopefully all of our listeners and um, your subscribers have been doing just that over the early parts of this summer and through the spring and been accumulating into the, the boring consolidation and weakness and uh, 
in the upper 20s, upper to mid 20s for silver and upper to mid 1500s for gold. Well, exactly. I should add on to that. I mean, you've done a good job of that at Silver Doctors, and I've done a good job at the Silver Investor. I mean, I've told everybody, public and otherwise, anytime you can buy silver under $30 a ounce or equivalent in gold, do it for the long term. And these are physical precious metals purchases. And, you know, it might have looked like not that great a statement until recently. And now, will we see $30 silver ever again? The answer is, I don't know. But I doubt it. I mean, I think, you know, we might get a pullback into the 32 range. Uh, we might get a pullback to 30. It could go lower, but I doubt it. I really think your chance to accumulate during that time frame you just outlined was a gift, really. But a lot of people do not buy the gifts. They wait. They want to see it go lower. And then, of course, it doesn't, so they end up buying higher. Yeah, as you mentioned, I wouldn't be surprised either if we never do see sub-30 silver again. Kind of it struck me, if you were watching the the tick-by-tick -tick trading when, a few weeks back when silver cleared 30, usually a, a big psychological resistance level like 30, um, a mark will trade up to it, and then there'll be quite a bit of profit taking right at that significant level, and there'll be quite a, a bit of a correction down. Silver traded up to 30, and I think it the lowest it traded down from there was 29.87, and that was for about 5 or 10 minutes. So I thought right there that it looked like we were going to clear silver and have quite a, quite a strong move through it. Yeah, agreed. I really like the way it's trading. It's trading in a very bullish way. It's acting as if uh, the shorts are, I don't want to say scrambling to get out, but uh, there's a lot of short coverings going on, even though, well, I want to be clear here. I mean, there's short coverings going on. That's, that's true. The big boys are kind of playing tough, and from the latest commitment of traders, which is always behind the time, so to speak, uh, it doesn't look as if that much short cover has been taking place from the commercial side, but that wait to, remains to be seen. There's been some speculation, especially from Ted Butler recently, that the other commercials are starting to leave J.P. Morgan out to dry. Do you see? Is that your take as well? Yeah, it's pretty clear. Um, you know, I'll kind of tip my ha uh, hand at Ted somewhat. I mean, Ted was really the first to really be bringing the commander traders reports to the attention of everyone, including myself. Uh, I found Ted very, very early on. In fact, found him through the phone book on the internet and gave him a call and started discussing it with him uh, years and years ago, probably, I don't know, 12 years ago. Regardless, yes, I think that that's a point to be made in what we see in the public data, but I want to be clear, and I've discussed this with Ted as well, and, uh, no one knows the real absolute true position. And the reason I state that so emphatically is that all we can see in the data is what's on the COT. We cannot see what the over-the-counter derivatives market looks like. I mean, as a hypothetical, as bizarre as this sounds, and I'm saying it only to wake people up and to teach the point, J.P. Morgan could be net long for all we know. Now, I'm not saying that they are, but what I am stating is that the over-the-counter market dwarfs the public market and between the Swiss banks and the offshore banks and the banks through London and the Isle of Man and all these other places that the bankers do their stuff uh, worldwide, you know, there could be a net position that really doesn't uh, line up with what we see in the public data. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that's true. What I'm trying to point out is that we don't really know their true positions. We do know what they are, again, in basis the COT, but we don't know what these over-the-counter positions are. We don't really know who's on the hook. Maybe J.P. Morgan has counterparties with all the central banks of the world, and that's why they keep so much clout. I mean, we just don't know. So these things really have to be thought through at more of a, I'd say, more of a deep level or more of a maybe an intuitive level where you need to really think about how the banking system operates, how much is in the seen world, and how much of it is in the unseen world, which for these derivatives, which is taking down the system, is, is mostly in the unseen world. And we don't really have any way of knowing what they're doing. Right. It's just crazy that the derivatives market remains unregulated with the size just dwarfing all other regulated open markets. All right, well, let's uh, switch gears a little bit here and kind of talk a little bit about silver supply-demand fundamentals. Harvey Organ and Steve St. Angelo recently pointed out the issues uh, Barrick is having getting its massive Pascualama uh, mine into production. It just so happens to be at about 20,000 feet of elevation <laughs> under a glacier. But they've pointed out that Barrick has forward contracts for silver wheat and promising to deliver around 200 million ounces of silver. And if Pascua doesn't make it into production, 
Barrick's going to have to purchase the silver on the market to, to deliver it to Silver Wheaton. So I guess what are your thoughts on the potential impacts on supply of silver if something like a mine like Pescuolama never comes online, as well as your thoughts on the, um, the current supply side for silver in general? Well, great question. I will answer it. Uh, I'm just going to give you a little background. The Pascalama mine was a huge, huge find. And in fact, when that silver discovery was made, I actually thought of the idea that Silver Wheaton has. This is not a unique idea, and they certainly didn't take it from me. Um, but, geez, it would really be nice to spin off you know, that kind of size of a mine. And I've been in some of my earlier lectures, if you look at some of the earlier stuff I've done on YouTube, I'm not suggesting anyone needs to or has to, I made a big deal about that size of a discovery because it's huge. And I stated that having, uh, you know, 20 million ounces uh, coming out um, on an annual basis or greater up to 30, 40 once they get full production is um, significant, very, very significant out of one mine. Uh, so that's the background. Now, the question, is it going to come out? Can they do it economically? They're on the hook with silver wheat, and what will happen? The answer, no one knows. Is it potentially a huge hazard to, uh, to Barrick? Absolutely. Uh, the cost overruns are substantial. We put that out to our members recently in one of our updates. On top of that, um, this contract's pretty well locked in. Silver Wheaton certainly knows what they're doing. Barrick decided, oh, sure, we'll take the financing. Why not? And it's turned into a, a, a problem. How big is it going to get? Again, we don't know. I think what it also emphasizes is the follow-on part of your question is, well, what's the overall general picture in supply demand for silver and the honest truth is the silver market is still very very tightly held um if we go back and look at silver's basic fundamentals of being in a deficit for 16 straight years until about 2007 and then being in quote unquote a surplus mining wise and recycling wise mining supply does not equal demand Total mining supply as of today does not meet total demand. But if you add in the 200 million ounces that are recycled every year on top of mining supply, you actually have a surplus. That surplus is eaten up by investment demand. And right now, the investment demand has been doing well, and I think it will increase. Actually, silver is almost counterintuitive. You really see more demand as the price goes higher. Now, that's insane because we're taught in Economics 101 that supply and demand regulate price. And that's true in silver to some extent. But I've been watching this market for now almost 40 years. And I know from watching it that it's one of the biggest momentum plays out there. The guys that trade whatever is moving, they don't care if it's silver or kumquats. Uh, silver has a tendency to move violently up and down, and they'll jump on and that momentum will carry it, and you actually get more volume as it's moving up for a while. And then, of course, like any economics 101, if the you know price gets too high, then you'll see a lot of shorting and everything else coming in. And of course, then you have to factor in the manipulation, and I hope we can just advert that discussion for today's interview. But Regardless, it's a market that really moves and therefore it catches a lot of attention and big money. All right, and just kind of to piggyback on that, what are your thoughts on the silver to gold sales ratio? The U.S. Mint sales, if, if we follow that over the last really five years, the, the, the ratio has been a, in a sustained uptrend of the Mint selling more physical volume of silver versus gold. Um, in the last two months, it's been really an astonishing, just about 75 to 1 of the sales volume of silver to gold. So obviously, that's not sustainable over the, the long term. So I guess, what are your thoughts on the overall market right now and the silver to gold sales ratio and where you see that playing out in the future? Well, again, uh, the market's tighter than most people suspect as far as the silver side is concerned. Gold is, is also quite tight, meaning that the real metal that's out there is being tightly held. Not many people are giving it up or wanting to sell the physical metal. Uh, as far as the trend that you outlined so eloquently, that's a trend that I predicted years ago. I said as things go on and the gold's price continues to get higher and higher, there's a lot of things that happen, but generally speaking, it gets priced out of the range of most people. I mean, you start looking at, you know, $2,000 an ounce gold. We're not there yet, but we're fairly close. And you're looking at, you know, some people's mortgage payments or maybe, you know, two gold coins as their mortgage payment or whatever. Whereas silver at, you know, $30 is still affordable to most people. And the dynamics are superior to silver than they are to gold, at least in my very, very studied view. So you'll see that trend continue, and it doesn't surprise me. I'm actually a little surprised it took 
as long as it took to get the trend established, but uh, that's okay. I mean, markets know more than me anyhow. Now, if, if you see the, the sales ratio continuing to increase and silver to continue to do well versus gold and the sales volume, what does that mean going forward in the long term for um, the gold-silver price ratio? Right. It, of course, it'll narrow more, and that's and thank you for that. Yeah, Eric Sprott made a, a very good point a couple of years ago at the Silver Summit. He'll be coming back here to Spokane in about a month. That the amount of money being put into gold and silver were about the same amount. Well, since silver is uh, such a small market relative to gold, that means that it puts a lot more price pressure on silver than it does gold because it's a small market. And, of course, you're verifying that even a better ratio with uh, what's been going on at the U.S. Mint with silver eagles versus gold eagles. So it will put the pressure on the price of silver, more so the price of gold. And you see the narrow, the uh, ratio narrow. Remember, we've already been down about 36 to 1 on in this bull market already. Now, it was there for a very short time. And... Um, it's now widened up to you know 60 to 1. Now we're back down to the low 50s again. But I really stated very early on in the early 2000s that I felt that the ratio would get to the what I call the monetary or the classic ratio, which is the establishment of by man what the correct ratio is supposed to be, which is set about 16 to 1. The natural ratio out of the ground back in the 13, 1400s was about 12 to 1. And today, the natural ratio is actually about 9 to 1, which means for every ounce of gold out of the ground, there's 9 ounces of silver. Obviously, I'm not talking about the same mine. I'm talking about global mining on a net basis. If you tally up the numbers that do the arithmetic, you'll find out that silver comes out about every you know 9 ounces of silver for every ounce of gold. So I really think that you're going to see a uh, ratio potentially of about a 10 to 1 uh, ratio at the top of the market. So 10 ounces of silver will buy one ounce of gold. Knowing what I know and knowing who I know, if you go back in the history of the last bull market and you quiz Bunker Hunt and asked him what the correct ratio was, Bunker believed that the correct ratio was 5 to 1, that uh, 5 ounces of silver would buy one ounce of gold. Now, I'm not suggesting it'll get that to that level. I'm not suggesting, it'll get, I am suggesting it could get to 10 to 1, doesn't mean it would, it could. Also, I'm doing an article in the next Morgan Report about par, would, could silver ever reach the par of gold? And I do that, not really tongue-in-cheek, I'm just asking the question, doing the study and giving my views to my paid readers. But what I'm suggesting is that the ratio is out of whack here, it's going to move toward par, but the reason I like to bring it up to par is because there's a lot of um, hedge fund managers and others out there that are what I call gold-centric. In other words, they really understand gold, know the gold story. And I found this true in Hong Kong on my last trip. Most of the big players in Hong Kong really understood gold quite well. But they really didn't understand silver. And, of course, the argument was often, well, silver's too bulky. Well, is it too bulky if it's par? I mean, if an ounce of silver and an ounce of gold trade at the same paper price, then is it too bulky? Then, of course, the answer is no. They take approximately the same amount of volume, although gold is denser. It's slightly less in volume than silver. But nonetheless, at par, it's certainly not too bulky. So when is it not too bulky? I know I just did a double negative, but when is it? It's the correct you know, bulkiness. Is it when it's a 5 to 1 ratio, 10 to 1 ratio, 20 to 1 ratio? What is the right ratio? And no one knows but the market, and especially in a free market, which I think we are going to see before this thing is undone, once the uh, paper price gets pushed out of the way, so to speak, and the real price is determined by the physical market. I would definitely agree as far as the statements with the ratio. I think Eric Sprott has also um, called for a 16 to 1 ratio, which is the historical and as you mentioned, I think the 2011 numbers are more like 9 to 1. So I think something like par, which for most investors, even silver bugs, might be almost too much to fathom. Uh, when you have a massive long-term secular bull market, in the mania blow-off phase, you can often see the market uh, move past the historical mean or the average. So I think it's definitely a potential that we'll see something like par or 5 to 1, at least uh, for a short-term blow-off peak. Now, it might not be sustained for the next 30 years, but we're talking a short-term blow-off peak. I agree. You know markets well, and you could see it. I mean, if you look at the 1980 spike, and, you know, the $50 silver is a reality, and I'm probably as guilty as a lot of people 
maybe overemphasizing that. I mean, we don't know how many trades went on at 50. It might have only been two or three trades. I mean, we might have talked only 10,000 ounces of silver on paper traded at that price. We don't know. What we do know is it was established, and it was a, a one-day event. But what we also know is that it hit the 16-1 ratio on that spike, and I think this time it will do better than that. I really do. Whether my you know guess of 10 to 1 is correct or not remains to be determined. But what we do know is that there's less physical silver available today than it was during the Bunky Hunt days. We also know that it's a global market today rather than just U.S. people that are concerned about this inflation that was rampant in 1979, 19, early 1980, until Paul Volcker came in and, and changed interest rates to, to quell the inflationary expectations. We also have a global situation that makes the 1980s look like the most stable monetary system that ever existed in the universe. So we have a lot of factors now that, in my book, make it almost a certainty that we're going to see uh, not only the nominal price in silver establish a new high, but a new real price established. And, of course, in today's paper terms, that'd be well above $135 an ounce. So I think that we're far, far, far from the top. I also want to emphasize that I don't think it's going to happen in 2013. I'm looking out probably 2016 or maybe in that range um, before we establish a new, the, the high, high. And, and then this time it's going to be a tough call. We're going to, are we going to get overvalued? Probably. And the thing I'm looking at for our members, and I'll probably still be doing some uh, of these type of interviews in the public, although I'm going to be cutting them back next year, is how do you value it? You value it basis silver. In other words, you take an ounce of silver, and when you can buy a new laptop computer for an ounce of silver, I'd say it's overvalued. And that's my you know quick take on it. In other words, you have to look at what does it purchase and determine, is this a historical mean or is this well above a historical mean or, or you personally? You know, I never thought I'd be able to buy that car for 10 ounces of silver or 100 ounces of silver or whatever it is, and you can. Well, you know, that's a, that's a determination. That's what a free market's all about. You take that 100-ounce bar of yours and you trade it for something that you want more than that 100 ounces of silver, do it. But we're not there yet. I wouldn't encourage anyone to do that today. But at the top of the market or nearing the top of the market, I'd certainly suggest that that's the way to think about it. Because thinking about it in terms of paper price only, I think at the top is going to be very misleading because we could be in a currency crisis where it really doesn't matter. The paper price is more or less meaningless. That's an excellent point. Why don't we wrap things up there? So before we let you go, David, can you tell our listeners about uh, where they can find your reports? Absolutely. The easiest place is on the Internet. It's an Internet-based business. You go to silver investor.com you can go to youtube the channel there is silver guru you can go to uh twitter and it's silver uh, yeah silver guru 22 on the twitter channel and the other thing i'd point out is i do do a free update on the uh, weekends for everyone that wishes to be on the list we do a little bit of advertising but normally it's kind of nice stuff meaning uh bullion dealers such as yourself that we trust and we'll send out a an e-message, but we also take a question a week. It's pretty valuable, and you can opt out any time, and that's just on the website, silver-investor.com. Look for join our free list, and it's only once a week. I don't really like to get these. I have I join some free e-lists myself, and, you know, almost daily, and you get tired of seeing them pop up in your inbox daily. I think once a week is sufficient. All right. David Morgan of the Morgan Report and silver-investor.com. Thanks for joining us today, David. My pleasure being with the Silver Doctors. Thanks, Doc. Thank <laughs> you.